to each one of you here tonight at the Thompson Lecture Hall. Ah, love the smiles. Anyway, I'm so glad that we're here tonight. Uh, and uh, we're just going to continue on with our session on kingdom exploration. Tonight we're going to begin with lesson, uh, session uh, 14, and uh, hopefully we'll also be doing session 15. And so uh, we want to welcome all of you who are here on the live stream uh, from wherever you might be in the world. And we just want to welcome you and uh, to be a part of what we are doing. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, send your questions, send your uh, uh, concerns, whatever you might have. Uh, we'll be glad to receive those. So um, anyway, let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, tonight, in Jesus' name, we just say thank you. Thank you for what you are doing in our lives. Thank you for this day. This is a day that you have fashioned. This is a day you have made. And we thank you for that. You have fashioned it with your heart, and you've established it with your word. And Lord, we bless you tonight. We ask you to open our understanding that we might comprehend the scriptures and understand the ways of the kingdom of God. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we have a, a couple more sessions. Um, I'm going to, tonight, I, in this session, I want to kind of finish, examine a couple different aspects of authentic authority, or spiritual authority. We began to deal with that in the last session. I want to evaluate it. And I want to look at the fact that the actions of Jesus of Nazareth authenticated the appraisal of his authority. And so actions authenticate appraisal of authority. And he comes out, uh, we're going to move in the next couple of weeks out from having been in the te uh, temptation, the wilderness of temptation, and he's going, we're going to see him next week moving out and returning in the power of the Holy Spirit. So tonight I want to talk about uh, what is necessary to uh, activate uh, the laws of the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom. And um, I'm trying to start a timer. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, I want to... Look at the realm of application, which is essential for the operation of the gospel of the kingdom of God in the midst of today's world. I, I have to just tell you that the gospel of the kingdom of God was mythologized more than 1,800 years ago by the Roman Catholic Church. And it has been hidden, as it were. Uh, it's been abused, it's been used, uh, but it hasn't been real. It hasn't been active. It hasn't been um, as predominant as it is in this hour. God is restoring the message and the method and the manner of the kingdom of God to the people. Uh, but I tell you, we cannot, we cannot conduct church as business as usual and expect to achieve results that are any different than what has been accomplished through past religious and even fleshly carnal efforts. I think we need to recognize that we need to change the way we've been conducting business. It, it doesn't matter how well-meaning our efforts have been. The majority of what we see over the last 1,800 years has, in fact, been contrary to the gospel of the kingdom of God. And we see today how the churches all over the world are virtually on the edge of destruction. And there are so many people who are entering into churches looking for hope who are finding nothing, nothing, because there is no life in them. There is no truth in them. And um, we are seeing whole denominations being dissolved right now. I have some friends who are part of certain denominations, and they are literally imploding on themselves uh, over the issues of homosexuality, over the issues of abortion, 
some of the other things, rather than looking at the, uh, the reality of what God's Word says, uh, they've deviated. And as a result, they're literally imploding on themselves. But um, let us go on. Let's just take a look at this in session four. I want you to recognize that the actions of Jesus authenticated the authority of Jesus. In John chapter 10, verses 37 to 38, Jesus says this. He says, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. And after he said this, they sought to seize him again. And so it's interesting that Jesus tied his works to his authority, to his identity. He says, if you don't believe me, believe me because of the works. And <coughs> the validation of the Holy Spirit's confirmation through signs, wonders, and miracles is based upon the relationship that Jesus had, the fellowship that Jesus had, and the internal obedience that Jesus had. And the same thing is true for us today. It's not enough to simply have a relationship and say, oh, well, I'm a Christian. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. But what is your fellowship in the Spirit? Being led by the Spirit, following the Spirit. And what about internal obedience? Not the kind of obedience of just going through the motions, but the obedience that works within you regardless of whether anybody's there to see you or not. One of the scriptures, that another one is John 14. John. 14 and verses 7 to 11. Now, my Bible says, he's speaking to Philip, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip, he says, he said to him, Lord, show us the father. And it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And he, so how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak them on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So Jesus is laying it out on the line there. He's making it very clear. You've seen me, you see the Father. You receive me, you receive the Father. He's introducing what we will be discussing the, the law of receptivity. This is the reoccurring standard of, that Jesus of Nazareth applied to himself to confirm his authority during his earthly ministry. He said this again and again and again and again. If you've seen me, believe me because of the works. If I do not do the works, then don't believe me. He ties believing in him to the works that he's doing. We might ask ourselves, if Jesus established that as the plumb line and applied to himself to confirm his authority and his identity during his earthly ministry, should there be any different measure of confirmation for the authority of his disciples today? Should we have a different set of guidelines? Or should we not also have should we not also have signs, wonders, and miracles confirming our words and confirming our actions as sons and daughters of God? Now, 
one of the things we realize is that every member of the body of Christ is assigned a realm of relational privilege and responsibility. They will be held accountable for on the day of the Lord. When we all appear before the Lord, it, we won't be judged on whether we believe or not believe because we won't be, we will have become, we have been accepted in the beloved. But there is a judgment of what did you do with your life? What did you do? Yes, you're a believer. Amen. Yes, you're a disciple. Amen. That's why you come into the kingdom of God. But then there will be a judgment. And we'll be talking about the day of the Lord judgment in the next quarter. But every member of the body of Christ, when their hearts are fashioned, when their purpose and destiny are put together, they are assigned a realm of relational privilege and responsibility unique to them. And they will, give an, they will be held accountable by God on the day of the Lord. Within the parameters of this privilege is found the responsibility and criteria for judgment. Now last week, we finished, in the last session, we finished talking about uh, privilege and responsibility. Privilege, responsibility, authority. And that authority carries with it is, is considered a privilege. Every privilege carries with it a responsibility. If we fail to fulfill the responsibility we risk the loss of the privilege. This is true with every member of the body of Christ. Now, every member of the body of Christ has a part to play. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16. It's there in the middle. It says, From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effectual working by which every part does its share, that causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now that's God's intention. That's God's design is that from Him the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament. It grows and builds itself in love as each, part does its, uh, as each part does its work. So we each have a responsibility. We are not just in it. We just can't slough along and just go along our merry way and, and not participate. We need to be a part of what's going on. Now, as a result, of the prevalence of our escapist, heaven-bound religious mythologies and pyramidic caste-class uh, distinction, we have failed to comprehend or apprehend this kingdom reality in functional practice. The two things have really cut the, the legs off of the body of Christ. The first one is the prevalence of the escapist heaven-bound religious mythologies. Okay, so I'm going, to get, I'm going to get saved and I'm going to heaven. And that's all my goal is. Die and go to heaven. The other one is our pyramidic caste class distinction. The clergy laity separation. And this has literally cut the knees out and cut the heart out of scriptures like the one we're talking about. Now, every member in the body of Christ has an aspect of a portion of the fullness of Christ dwelling within them as their reward to be shared with other members of the body of Christ and the whole world. See, each part of us, if Christ is in you, if the Spirit of God is in you, then there's a part of Christ in you that needs to come through you into the world. And that's a reasonable expectation. Everyone is gifted. And uh, 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. 
Every believer has received a gift of grace from God. There are no paupers. Now we might think we are, we might act like we are, we might not live up to what God's standard is, but everyone has been given a purpose and a grace in God, and we are to serve one another as faithful stewards. We need to faithfully steward the gift of God within us. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. It's a judgment of justice. Now, this is really important because we will not be able to execute justice in the earth on behalf of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus until we come into this measure of unity of heart and purpose. Our motive and purpose. Now, let me just give you a couple of scriptures here. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7. Isaiah chapter 9. And verse 7. Now my Bible says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judge, judgment and justice, from this time forward, even forevermore. So you have two words. You have judgment. And you have justice. Without judgment, there can be no justice. Justice is dependent upon judgment. Now, in the whole of the church, is told, oh, you're not supposed to judge. You're not supposed to have a judgment. As a result, we do not execute justice on behalf of the kingdom of God. Now, another version, another verse is Isaiah. And this one is 42.4. Let me read that. He will not fail or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. See, Jesus came to establish judgment and justice. He will bring, establish it with judgment and justice, and he will establish justice in the earth and bring justice to victory in the earth. Now, judgment is a declaration of truth and justice is the result causing or producing righteousness. Okay, let me say that again. Judgment is a declaration of truth while justice is the result causing or producing righteousness. So you make a judgment based on proclamation of truth and it results in justice resulting or causing righteousness to rise up. Without righteousness, there is no justice. Justice and righteousness are linked together. Jesus of Nazareth invested the authority to execute justice within the jurisdiction of the kingdom of God through the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So, Jesus as the Lord of heaven and earth, as the one who, to whom all authority has been given, then gives, he invests that authority to execute justice within the jurisdiction of the kingdom of God. So we are called to join, that's why Paul writes in another place, do you not know that we are going to judge the angels? Can you not judge one another? 
See, judgment brings about justice. Now, the content of what Jesus, or what God is saying is in the context of the tapestry of the narrative of history. So as you go through history, you can see the Lord bringing restoration of truth. And it impacts and affects the tapestry of the narrative of history. But most of us don't learn much from history. We're not interested in history. We're all about right now, right here, and what, what affects me. Now, I want to just turn a little bit here for a moment. And I want to talk about the humanistic appraisal of delegated authority. Now, this is dealing with authority, and I want you to see in Luke 20, verses 1 and 2. Now, it's happened on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel of the kingdom of God, that the chief priests and the scribes, together with the elders, confronted him and spoke to him, and they said, Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Or, who gave you this authority? See, they want to know, who's the man, who's the agency, who is the ecclesiastical group, or the governmental group that gave you the authority to do these things? Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but I love this phrase. Now, it happened on one of those days. I don't know if you've ever had one of those days. One of those days when people are attacking you. One of those days when people are, are criticizing you. I, I don't know. Wow, have you, have you ever had one of those days? Well, Jesus had one of those days. And, you know, which ecclesiastical body gives that kind of authentic spiritual authority today to anyone? Who is it that can give the power to raise the dead, to restore blind eyes, who can preach the gospel this way or that way? Who gives that authority? No one. That authority must come from God. But their perspective, their humanistic appraisal is tell us, by what authority are you doing these things and who is he who gave you this authority? Now. People walking in the flesh will always challenge those walking in the spirit. It, it's just, it's given, it's a given law. They will demand to know where they receive their authority to do or say what they are doing or saying. I was talking to some people recently. I said, where do you get your permission? If you're going to start something, if you're going to start a, an activity, if you're going to start something beyond your local congregation, who, will, who, go, who do you go to? Do you go to your, your local government? Do you go to a local board of a couple churches or something, or this denomination or that? You better go to God. And you better receive your authority from God. And it'll be the anointing of the Holy Spirit, or it's nothing. Now, I want to take a moment to examine the humanistic of appraisal of delegated authority. And I want to recognize that there should be, or in fact there are no, let me make it a little bit different, there are no pyramids in the kingdom of God. Now, there are a lot of pyramidic structures in what men call the church. But in the church that Christ is building, there are no pyramidic structures. There should be no pyramidic class distinction and clergy, laity, caste system within the body of Christ. Now, what we need to realize is that we are in the process, the Holy Spirit is in the process of dismantling 1,800 years of Romanist tradition. We are in the process right today, the Holy Spirit is bringing revelation of the kingdom and he is, he is dismantling the clergy, laity, caste, class system that has paralyzed the church. Now in Romans 8, 
verse 5, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Because that's where their thinking is. In Romans 8, 7, just a few verses later, it says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, or at war against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. Now, folks, help me here. The law of God represented in Romans 8, 7 is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is the context of what he's writing about. He is not talking about the Mosaic law. He is talking about Romans 8, 2 says that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. He is not talking about the law of Moses. It is not subject to the law of God, and what he means is it's not subject to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Religious, corporate style, pyramidic authority structures are the fruit of the kingdom of darkness, not the kingdom of God. Now God has used them, the Holy Spirit has allowed them, but the day has come when revelation and relationship with God will dissolve the relevancy of that form of government. Now, such structures are formed by humanistic ideologies and imaginations, often being aided by demonic mythologies and perversions. I'm sorry to inform you that much of what we call the church, men call the church, doesn't even bear the slightest resemblance to what Jesus of Nazareth is building. It lacks the power, it lacks the holiness, it lacks the the determination, it lacks the character, it lacks so much. And we call it the church because we simply just don't know anybody. The government of the kingdom of God is primarily Hebraic in nature, family. The government of religious Christianity is Greek or corporations, corporate. So you see that the the Hebraic government style of the kingdom of God is family, interrelationships. While the government of religious Christianity that was born in Rome and Greek is corporate. And that's where we got it from. That's where the distortion and the perversion came from. Now, as we continue with this humanistic, the whole idea and concept of pyramidic religious system and hierarchy form of government is unfounded in the New Testament that was established by the Father and Jesus Christ. I've got two graphs here. This one here is of Buddhism. And you'll see, a Hinduism, excuse me, at the base of it is the untouchables. And then it works right on up the word. You have God, gods at the tops, and you have the Brahmins, and you have all these different caste systems, and it's pyramidic. The lower you go, the more people you have. But, guess what? In the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, What did we have? We have kings at the tops with nobles, knights, vassals, merchants, farmers, craftsmen, peasants, and serfs. And at the very top is God. So we have this pyramidic structure of our culture and society ingrained into us by kings who had a divine right to rule. See, the divine right to rule authorized the abuses of kings and nobility at the top of the pyramid. And the same thing is true today with religious leaders who find themselves like kings at the top of the religious pyramid. Now, when authoritative structures become embedded into our cultural fabric, it requires a paradigm shift to accomplish any meaningful functional change which is able to be perpetuated through more than two generations before reverting back to humanistic and worldly philosophy. 
Now, how do I know that's true? I study history. I look at revivals throughout the centuries. And I see we witness this cycle repeatedly as we study the history of revelational restoration and reformational movements over the past 600 years. Since the Reformation began, God will bring Reformation, revelational restoration and reformational movements, and within two generations, that much of it has reverted back to the same type of structure as they came out of. They may have come out of the Catholic Church, and they may have renamed a priest into a a pastor, but they revert right back into that structure within a couple generations. The Anabaptists did the same things. The Methodists did the same things. All the different religious groups have all done it. And we're still doing it. And if we don't change this cycle of destruction, the movement of the prophetic and the apostolic and the kingdom of God will do exactly the same thing. And they have been doing it. We've got a whole bunch of super pastors out there who claim to be super prophets and super apostles. And it's erroneous, and it's wrong, and it needs to be corrected. What did Paul write to the Galatians? Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? See, this is our challenge today, my friend. The Holy Spirit will breathe through uh, an arena uh, of a community of believers And they will come all on fire. There will be revelation. And they'll go. And within just a short time, they rebuild the altars of their forefathers all over again. They receive the spirit of revelation by faith. And they go right back into law. Now, I want you to notice these these here uh, pyramids. But notice the similarities of a typical pyramidic church structure. You know, here it is. You've seen these. You've gone to these churches. Maybe you are in these churches. Maybe you're a pastor in a church like this. You have God. Then you have the senior pastor. Then, of course, you have a church council. You have a worship minister, student pastors, education, Sunday school. And it all works right on down. Look at here. Missions office and evangelism and ministry teams are down at the bottom. Interesting. Now, if you challenge this, if you challenge this pyramidic structure in most churches, they will say, oh, well, we are walking in plurality of leadership. But their hearts are climbing a corporate ladder. They're wanting to be seen. They're wanting to be noticed. They're wanting to be recognized. They sell their wares in the marketplace. And they're just trying to climb the corporate ladder, religious ladder. Until, at some point, they're at the top. And God, as what I'm saying to you is there's no difference between this pyramid and the Buddhist pyramid or the pyramids of kings and nobles in the Middle Ages. It comes out of the same heart of the flesh. It comes out of the same heart of hell. Now, there's clearly a rejection on the part of authority of Jesus' released authority. Now. I I carefully use two words, delegated authority and released authority. And we will be discussing the differences between delegated authority and released authority in uh, in another session. But in Luke chapter 20, verse 20, 2020, it says, They watched him, and they sent spies in who pretended to be righteous, that they might seize upon his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. See, they had to answer to the power and authority of the governor of Rome. 
the emperor, Nero, whoever it happened to be at the time. The religious authorities plot to hand Jesus of Nazareth over to the Roman, Ro Roman Empire civil authorities who held the nation in bondage. They hold the nation in slavery, and yet they're the ones who are controlling what's going on in the temple and what's, who's going to be there and what's going to happen. Now, in John chapter 11, verses 47 and 48, we see the true motive of their concern is for their own religious and political positions which were they were given by men. It says, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs, signs, wonders, and miracles. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So, rather than rejoicing that the blind could see, rather than rejoicing that the, the cripple could walk, rather than rejoicing that, that a widow's uh, son was brought back from life, rather than rejoicing in that, they were more concerned about their own place, their own authority, their own rule. Today, the same symptoms are found in many religious organizations. It is the, this is the reason that there's so much jealous control and manipulative dominion of one person over another. They're trying to rule over one another. Because this is where their authority comes from. It comes from a governmental agency rather than from God. It is the fruit of the kingdom of gloom and darkness from which we have been delivered. And such theology steals God of glory being manifested in and through much of the church today. So you might have, you might have 400 people in your church. But there's only five or six who are actually being used by God. You say, well, that's just the way it is. Well, yes, it is the way it is. But I'm telling you what, this literally handicaps many members of the body of Christ because they're never going to get around to going to Bible school. They're never going to get around to it. And they're never going to find their place and their calling and their purpose in God. Now, there's a really interesting scripture in. 3 John, verses 9 to 11. Now, I, I find this interesting in a number of ways. This is, the, this is the Apostle John, the beloved of the Lord. He's writing this letter. And he says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephus, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I, come, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. Now, this is the pastor. This is the leader. And he's rejecting the Apostle John, who is the beloved of Jesus. <laughs> and then guess what? He says, yeah, he says, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Now can you imagine the consequences of a pyramidic structure where there are people who want to have the preeminence? I am at the top of this. This is my church. You can't come in here. I don't want you reading that man's writings. I don't want you going ah, blah, 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 blah. Beloved, he says, John writes, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Look at this. The, having a love to have the preeminence among them is considered evil by John the Revelator. How then can we not also consider those who desire and love to have the preeminence also evil in this day? It's all about me. I'm the big shoe. Show. Now the thing is, here's what he says. He who does good is of God, but he who does not evil has not seen God. Now, 
Diotrephes had not had the epiphany uh, encounter with God to see him and his kingdom from Christ's perspective. See, it requires an epiphany, an encounter, a revealing of Christ and him crucified and raised up and victorious. And when I see the kingdom of God from his perspective, it will humble me and change me. But obviously, Diotrephes has not seen that. Now, the thing that's kind of frightening is that this took place within the very first generation of Christianity. It didn't take place 200 years later. John was an original apostle of Jesus. He walked with Jesus. And yet within his generation, within one generation, this foulness had creeped in to the church, at least this one place, if not more. Now consider that after it became Romanized and then established, and for 1,800 years, how hard this is. This is so ingrained in the fabric of our minds, in the fabric of our cultures. There was a man a few years ago, a couple hundred years ago, William Booth, he started the Salvation Army. And he looked from... From the 1800s, he looked into the 1900s. And he, he wrote this. He said, The chief danger of the 20th century will be religion without Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, and heaven without hell. And that's precisely what you have on the mainstream today. And it really shows us the grave danger of the one-man show. I'm telling you, the person who just has to do it all. He's got all the tricks. He's got all the magic wand. He's able to do everything. He's the one-man show. He don't need nobody. If you want to show up, I'll entertain you. In fact, a man named Charles Spurgeon, also of the 1800s, he said, the time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the flock, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. This is the condition of the church today that God is dismantling and reviving and restoring. But as He brings the gospel of the kingdom of God back and restores our understanding, we're going to have to get rid of some of this stuff. We're going to have to change the way we've been doing business. Today the Holy Spirit is dismantling 1,800 years of clergy, laity, caste, class, distinction, and traditions which have been demonically perpetuated through perverted theology and religious ritualistic practice in what men call the church. It was undoubtedly the seed of corruption which spawned the Roman Catholic hierarchy a few years after Diotrephes. My friends, it is a challenging season we live in. But we ne- dare not hold back. We dare not stop. We must press. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. We need to change the way we have been the church. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. I just pray, God, that you would just take these words and you would just use them to stimulate thought, stimulate activity, and stimulate change. And may revelation be restored and produce reformation which then results in revival. Revelation being restored by the Holy Spirit, which when put into practice will produce a reformation that will then produce revival that will change our generation forever. I pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen and amen. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in just 10 minutes. Thank you very much.